No? So, direct adaptation within a population by directly observing beak wings associated with the fruit they exploit. So, great example of direct observation. And of course, bacteria are champions of evolution. So, uh, if you've watched various medical TV shows, you've undoubtedly heard the term MRSA. So, anybody happen to know what MRSA stands for? Ah, uh, cool, I get to teach you something new. Methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. So, Staphylococcus aureus is the actual name of the bacteria. Methicillin is an antibiotic that we used to use to treat Staph aureus. In some populations of Staph aureus bacteria, we have seen methicillin resistance. Methicillin is no longer effective in treating that bacterial infection. So, methicillin uh, pretty much prevents bacteria from synthesizing their cell walls. So they can't synthesize their cell walls. They can't live. Highly effective at killing off Staph aureus. But at some point we saw the existence of a methicillin resistance gene that very quickly propagated into the population. This is because the selective pressure was extreme. It wasn't just increasing their ability to survive and reproduce, it was a zero and one. Die or live. When you have that kind of selective pr uh, pressure, when something allows the organism to live, it very quickly passes on in the population. Bacteria reproduce very quickly. They have logarithmic growth. You know, one produces two, two produces four, eight, 16, 32, and so on. So they reproduce very quickly. So once that methicillin resistant gene became present in the population, that population very quickly became methicillin resistant. Uh, the reason bacteria are champions at evolution uh, is because, for one, they are very mutation prone. Uh, eukaryotic cells, if you remember from Gene Bio 1, um, they're bigger cells, but they have various mechanisms to prevent mutation. So, whenever the genome is replicated, uh, you may have various mechanisms within there to cut out mutations. Prokaryotes, bacteria, have no such mechanism. So if a mutation occurs, it's passed on. So if it's beneficial, it passes on. If it's negative, it dies out. So you get appearance of traits that have mutated quite often. Bacteria can also pick up genes from other bacteria. Their reproduction, their well, quote, unquote, they're, they're, it's sort of like bacterial sex. Uh, so basically, you'll have a bacteria that has a certain gene that allows it to extend a pilus and connect to another bacteria, and then it can pick up uh, the accessory genetic information. So bacteria have something called the plasmid, which is separate from the genome. So you can see various mutations arise in the plasmid DNA, uh, and if they uh, happen to be negative, um, they can be overridden by the genome. Uh, if they happen to be positive, they're used. And so, bacteria that can extend its little bridge, its pilus, can pick up the plasmid and pick up, you know, those advantageous genes. So, bacteria can do that between separate bacterial species. Uh, or strain, because the species concept is not all that great for bacteria. So, uh, you see a lot of evolution within bacterial populations, which is pretty cool. 
because it provides a lot of evidence for evolution. Two different of ways to directly observe evolution. We see this in a lot of direct observations. Direct observations of Galapagos finches. Their beaks change based on environmental conditions. We can see those beak changes proliferating in populations every season. Charted over a couple of decades, you've got a lot of direct observation for evolutionary change. Accumulate enough differences and you get speciation. A lot of people say, well, not a lot, but hopefully a minority of people say, you know, uh, sure, you'll see proliferation of adaptive traits in a population, but one population splitting off into two separate populations, which become separate species, that's horseshit. It's crap, horse crap. Um, and the thing is, people don't happen to have a good grasp on evolutionary time or geologic time, right? One person lives, you know, 60 to 80 years, maybe a little more, maybe a little less. Um, and that's sort of the amount of time we are capable of comprehending. We can get a handle on decade or a couple of decades. Um, when you say 200 years, 300 years, our brains can't handle that. We do our best to envision that. And then when you say 2,000 years or a million years, that is a lot of time for various traits to accumulate in populations, for various different traits to accumulate in populations. And you can get some very distinct differences in organisms over a couple million years. Uh, but, you know, even then, when we talk about the species concept in, I think, the next lecture, or the one after that, I can't remember, but when we talk about the species concept, we'll see that the term species is pretty fast and loose. It's not this, like, you know, immutable phrase, this is one species and this is another species and never the twain shall meet or, you know, breed. So, we'll talk about that. All right, so. More evidence for evolution can be found in homologous structures. So a homologous structure is a structure that is derived from a common ancestor. So derived from a common ancestor, but appears different, has different functions based on different species. Uh, so it might be helpful to talk about the concept of the common ancestor. So when we talk about, you know, accumulation of traits and speciation over time, uh, that is uh, based on, you know, divergence from common ancestry. So we've all seen the pretty famous picture where you have a chimp and you have, you know, your maybe Australopithecus primitive hominid and then you'll have like Homo erectus and then you'll have caveman, Neanderthalensis and then you'll have modern man. And it's basically just this line straight through them. Uh, and that leads to a lot of misconceptions about evolution. Uh, I once gave a speech in high school about evolution, informational speech, right? Uh, having no idea that in Colorado, where I lived, there happened to be some varying opinions. And, like, people leapt out of their desks to challenge me. And someone said, you know, if monkeys turned into people, why are there still monkeys? Checkmate, evolutionists. Uh, so, one, you know, monkeys didn't turn into people. That's crap right there. Uh, but two, uh, common ancestry is where you examine how evolution occurs. So, a common ancestor is an ancestral species that is the closest relative to two species you're examining. So if you have, you know, this is our common ancestor, right? 
and from that we get branches on an evolutionary tree. Uh, and these branches represent various species. So if we're looking at this chain trying to examine uh, the evolution of man, right? You have all these various species. Uh, I'm just going to play fast and loose here. Uh, so say this is the chip, which is the specific one someone yelled at me. Why are there still chimps? Well, when you look at a chart of common ancestry, here is, you know, modern man. So if this were a family tree, this would be your cousin, maybe your third or fourth or fifth cousin. And so, you know, why are there still chimps? It's like, if you have a fifth cousin, how did you appear? Why is there still a fifth cousin? That's just not how it works. So we have common ancestry. So when we say a trait is derived from a common ancestor, you have this trait, and it appears in multiple descendants. So maybe opposable thumbs. So opposable, opposable thumbs are derived from a common ancestor between, you know, uh, really all primates uh, and man, which is still pretty much firmly in primates. Uh, we separate, you know, primates into various uh, groups. Uh, so you'll have monkeys, uh, you'll have apes, and you'll have the group that uh, modern man is descended from, which is the uh, hominids. So um, various different groups, but they'll have that trait. So in homologous structures, that derived trait appears differently and has different functions. So we can see this in vertebrates very easily when we look at the structure of, in humans, the arm, right? So we have some bones, uh, the humerus, radius and ulna, uh, the carpals with our, the wrist bones, right? You have the metacarpals, which are the bones right here in your hand, uh, and then we have the phalanges here, right? Uh, and when we look at various other vertebrates, the cat, well, there's a humerus, radius, ulna, uh, carpals, metacarpals, phalanges. If you look at a whale, humerus, radius ulna, carpals, metacarpals, phalanges, a bat, same deal. So homologous structures are present in multiple species. Okay, so my battery's about to die, so these videos won't cover the whole lecture, uh, although it might not have been fully charged, so we'll see what happens over time. So. Uh, homologous structures derived from a common ancestor but have different functions. So, you know, you have the human arm. Why in the heck would you see phalanges, metacarpals, carpals, radius ulna, and humerus in the fin of a whale unless that trait was inherited from a common ancestor? You know, that is not a great way to have a flipper or a fin. Uh, it's a lot easier to have a different structure, maybe one that's more effective. But because that is the trait we had to work with, that is the trait we see. And so seeing these common structures in you know, limbs that function differently is great evidence for evolution, homologous structures. And of course, uh, natural selection is able to act on these homologous structures. These are variations that are inherited in a population. So natural selection will produce homologous structures only if that variation affects fitness and it is inherited. So kicking it back. So uh, very cool. Um, so in even more diverse organisms like a chicken and a human, uh, during embryonic development, we can see 
various similar structures. So here's an embryo, and there is a little post-anal tail. And here's our chicken, and there's a little post-anal tail. Here are pharyngeal pouches, which are uh, little vestiges of gill slits in a chicken, which is most definitely not breathing through gills, and a human embryo, which is also not going to breathe through gills as an adult. So why should you see those gill slits unless they were a trait in a common ancestor that was passed on over time? So, very cool. Then we have vestigial structures. Uh, so, vestigial structures are traces of a trait that was once functional, that once affected fitness, right? So, um, we have, for instance, uh, in this little monkey, uh, we have a little trait here, a little uh, ear flap uh, that can be moved in non-human primates. Uh, and the movement of that allows you to alter how sound enters the ear. So you move that around and you can hone in on different sounds. Uh, and so in humans, um, you'll see a little extension right here. You can feel it on yourselves right in there. It's just a little extension of cartilage. Uh, more obvious in some than others. Um, and it serves no function now. It does Well, at least it doesn't serve the original function. And it really is not affecting inheritance or uh, success, fitness anymore. So um, that is a vestigial structure. So you see these a lot um, in species. For instance, this is a very cool one. Whales have hips. So this is the remnant of the pelvis. Right here, just a little set of bones that have absolutely zero function for the whale. It's just a pelvis, and a whale absolutely don't have legs, so that is definitely a vestigial structure. But when we look at its structure, it is similar to the pelvis in terrestrial animals. So, very cool. Uh, and apparently the next slide is blank for some reason. Oh no, I just didn't have the picture in there. Uh, sometimes mutations will actually activate uh, pelvis development in cetaceans uh, and dolphins. Uh, so uh, you can actually see uh, a production from that. So uh, occasionally you'll find a dolphin with vestigial limbs. Uh, so the genes that basically uh, deactivate development of the pelvis will somehow become, you know, dormant and you'll get some development. There's not enough information there to actually produce functional limbs, but you'll get these little limb buds. Uh, and so it's pretty great evidence uh, for the evolution of whales and dolphins from a terrestrial ancestor. Because why should you have uh, pelvis and occasional, you know, vestigial limb development if you didn't have an ancestor with a pelvis and legs that that vestigial structure was descended from? So it's pretty darn awesome. So. You can even see this in uh, much larger cetaceans than a dolphin. In 1919, a female humpback whale had protrusions. Uh, so, it was pretty cool. And then we get a lot of evidence for evolution from the fossil record. So, fossil record is where we find bones from extinct organisms. Um, and we can see distinct differences in all these various species, but when we look at some of these bones, we can find very common conserved structures. So, for instance, uh, most mammals have this uh, little carpal bone um, 
that has a very specific structure, right? Pretty simple. Uh, in cetaceans and even toad ungulates, like uh, deer, um, we see a distinct feature there. Uh, so relatively even height, uh, and this one is more broad. Uh, so in this extinct organism called Pachycetus, we see a similarity more to pigs and deer than dogs. So, or, you know, aquatic reptiles. So we see these bones uh, that are very similar to other groups of animals, suggesting a uh, geological time recent common ancestor, or a common ancestor much closer to deer and pigs than dogs. And so we can look at these distinct fossil identifiers, like uh, in whales and dolphins, a feature of the skull. There, there are some bones there that are present only in whales and dolphins. And if we look through the fossil record, we can find some terrestrial organisms that also feature that uh, structure. It allows us to build these evolutionary relationships based on similarities in bone structure. So it's pretty awesome that we have as many uh, similarities as we have found, right? Because 90%, 99% of all organisms that have ever lived have not become fossilized. So with the rarity of fossilization, it's pretty amazing that we have an amazing, you know, a, a massive diversity in, you know, organisms that we can link together based on physiological traits. Pretty Darn awesome. I think I'd talk about birds a little later, but uh, running short on time, so I'll just continue to do the next evidence for evolution, which is a relatively recent development in studying evolution, molecular evidence. So we can examine DNA, proteins, genes. So stuff at the molecular level. So for instance, this chart is uh, examining differences between amino acids and hemoglobin. So amino acids are the little monomers that make up proteins. So if we look at these different vertebrates, organisms with bones, we can examine the differences in hemoglobin based on different amino acids. So we find between humans and an old world monkey like the macaque, very little differences, only eight amino acid differences in the construction of hemoglobin. But as we get further apart in evolutionary time, as we go back and find further, you know, older common ancestors, we get more differences. Between humans and dogs, there's 32. Humans and birds, 45. Humans and frogs, 67. Humans and lamprey, 125. Suggesting how related these organisms are. So, the more recent the common ancestor, the more similar the genes, the more similar the DNA. So by examining the differences in DNA or proteins or genes, we can get charts of relatedness, which is pretty cool. So, um, so some humans and chimps share something like 99% of genes. So uh, it's 